it was in more of the vision-based uh, systems. And you'll see now he's the uh, co-founder and managing director of NavViz, uh, which is a company doing some very exciting things. And I'll let him actually tell you much more about that. So uh, with that, I'll give you uh, Gerrit Schroth. This technology, as Todd already said, really started at my time in the GPS lab. Um, and as you already <clears throat> all know, um, three things are really, three technologies are really ubiquitous um, outdoors. The first thing is um, detailed and really up-to-date maps, even in 3D. The second thing is that these, um, that you have ubiquitous access to these uh, 3D maps. So um, like if you hear from a screenshot from Google, uh, Google Maps, you can access them from your browser, from your smartphone, from um, any device. It's really everywhere available. And the third thing is, of course, reliable GPS. And these three technologies have really formed a platform for a, a huge variety of applications. We have uh, seen in the poster of the SCP and T symposium. And of course, um, you're all aware of um, all of these things like navigating from A to B, avoiding traffic jams, ride sharing, and even uh, today, autonomous driving is all relying on that. So we all know that. And if we look inside a building, the situation looks quite different. Here, we typically lack these three technologies, right? So we do not really have up-to-date or detailed maps typically. Um, and we also do not have, obviously, access to those maps. And of course, um, most of the time, we also lack GPS reception. So this is kind of surprising that this hasn't been solved yet, um, because as we already also noted today, almost 90% of our GDP actually happens inside. So there is actually a huge variety of indoor processes lack these kind of technologies. And that's what we, or why we actually would like to change that. So to do that, we really need to build these technologies for indoors. And um, the first thing that you need to do is really to generate or to come up with a method to um, map um, buildings at large scale and very, very efficiently. So unfortunately, you can't just fly over those buildings uh, with an airplane and map them. You really have to go inside. And um, to this end, we have developed this, as you can see, uh, this mobile mapping system we call the M3 trolley. And it's actually equipped with um, laser scanners and cameras. And as you push it through the corridors, it records a photorealistic 3D model of the environment. And it does it in a very fast and, uh, and efficient way so that you can um, easily scan 30 to 50,000 square meters on a single day, so just regular walking speed. So that's actually the size of a mid-sized mall. So with this, actually, we record um, not just uh, the geometry and the texture, we also record things like Wi-Fi fingerprints, Bluetooth fingerprints, we even record magnetic field disturbances. So all of these information are really important, as you will see later. Now that we have a way to really efficiently build, uh, sorry, um, scan buildings, we also want to have a way to access this. So with this software, you can, uh, sorry, with this data, you can right away go into very specialized software from architects or civil engineers, and now make actually use of this um, data, but only also from trained personnel and on very powerful machines. So now to enable these variety of applications, you also need a very efficient way to access this data from anyone and any device. So that means, again, via a browser, or at least via a smartphone. And to this end, we developed um, the so-called Indoor Viewer, which I'll show you in a bit, um, that allows you to really walk through the environment uh, from your desktop and um, yeah, really virtually explore it intact with that, do measurements in this environment, navigate from A to B. All these things can be done in two days browsers. So with a way to map buildings efficiently and to visualize and interact with them, the third thing that you need is a position inside a building. And there has been quite, some, quite a number of technologies out there um, that try to do that. And most of them are typically Wi-Fi or Bluetooth-based systems. They all, however, have in common that you need to have quite some infrastructure that you put, put out there. So it's not just the initial cost of setting it up, but also maintaining that. And so these costs or these, um, these things have been actually the major hurdle for a widespread adoption of indoor positioning, unfortunately. So in contrast to that, we follow a quite different approach in a sense that we use the camera of your smartphone so that it actually recognizes the visual appearance of your surroundings and that is then matched to the 3D model recorded by the trolley. So thereby, very much similar to human orientation, you determine your position by recognizing the visually most similar scene or location inside a very large and complex uh, large, um, building. So we'd like to go through um, these te uh, technologies one by one. So the trolley, as you can see it here, um, as I said, it's equipped with laser scanners and cameras. And um, it actually is basically the first thing it does, it creates an initial map using its, its uh, laser scanners and the cameras. And then um, 
in Insider's map, it localizes itself in. So these kind of algorithms are called simultaneous localization and mapping algorithms, or short SLAM. And those are also the algorithms that are used in today's autonomous driving um, technology. So they're uh, quite alike. So at the same time, while we actually record um, the geometry and the texture, as I said, we also record pretty much else, anything else that we can actually capture inside a building. So the easiest way to show you what we have actually, what we are mapping is probably to, to use the Indo viewer, our browser-based viewer right away, um, to look at that data. So, um, what you can see here is actually inside a browser. You can open that yourself as well. Um, we are at uh, Munich uh, Museum, it's actually quite a famous one. And as you can see, you just can look around yourself um, all the way 360 degree. You can also look to the ceiling and um, you can also look to the floor and you might wonder where's the trolley and where's the person who pushed the trolley. Well, um, there's actually quite some nice algorithm behind that and if you want uh, to know more, then please reach out to me at the end of the presentation. I can give you a little bit more details on how we do that, how we generate a full 360 degree uh, view of the environment. So I'll just click over there to this painting and I'll basically have a look at, um, at this painting and uh, just can move to that and I can zoom into quite some detail and um, zoom out again. And um, you might have recognized that the, at, the, um, at the position of my mouse cursor, there is this white disk and it actually resembles the uh, 3D environment of myself. So I really intera can interact uh, with the 3D environment as I always know the actual 3D position at the position of my cursor. So if I want to, for instance, create a point of interest here, I'll just right click and give it some name um, and some category obviously as well, um, just randomly. Um, and then um, here really the link between any other system, any other content actually is created. Now I can add here anything that fits into an HTML5 container like video, audio, direct output from other sensors like in, in, um, uh, in fabrication scenarios where you need sensors that to be displayed here. In my case, I will just add again some text. But you see basically here, this is really the link between other systems and um, the 3D coordinate that it actually has. So um, you might wonder how that's actually um, done. Um, we can actually show you also the, the 3D geometry that has been recorded by the trolley. And what you just saw here very briefly is that we stream inside of this browser the 3D geometry that has been recorded by the trolley. So I can just move around here. I can even do um, a measurement here. Let me just show you that. I'll just right click here. And then you just right away find out uh, what the diameter of this painting is. And um, of course you can use the 3D geometry for, for many more stuff. And the interesting part about this is actually that there's quite some technology behind to make this possible, to render like these billions of points that have been recorded, 3D points, uh, by the trolley into my browser. And if I, if I rotate here, you will see quickly how actually the, um, the granularity will get finer and finer. It just streams this point load into my browser. That means I only have to download into my client the, the things that I really look at. And also only these parts have to be rendered, which actually allows me to look at this powerful data now from a regular PC and even a smartphone can do it now. So while we used very, or needed very specialized software and very powerful machines with very strong GPUs, now this can be done on, even on your smartphone based on that technology. So what you can also just do, um, to give you a little bit of an overview, I can just fly out of this building here. Oops. So here you go. Basically see the whole building. I will just add the rest of the, um, of the building here and I will stream that in there as well. So see how fast the whole building can be loaded. This actually, um, this museum has been mapped in two hours, just to give you an idea of how, how fast and scalable the mapping system, these small mapping system can be. Uh, while this is a relatively small scenario, I would like to switch to another one, which is actually the Technical University of Munich. Um, so I can also look around as I want. I can also go up uh, one floor and have a look at it here as well. And um, I'll just open this here, the 2D map. Um, that gives you like an idea of how large this environment actually is. We have actually mapped large environments like this, but this is a very nice example that I can show publicly. And um, by the way, everything that I show you here was completely automatically generated. So there was no manual interaction whatsoever. All this data, except for the POIs that have been annotated, were, um, have been created um, by the algorithms of, um, of the system. 
So this includes also the ability to um, yeah, do routing inside of this. You would also expect this from a digital model of a building that you can just route from A to B. And maybe I want to just meet with some colleague here at a cafe at the Technical University. I will just type in cafe and it will show me the next cafe or like the cafes that are actually available inside um, this building complex and will give me additional information. So now I just click route two and it will also show me the route to that location. And it also extracts that semantically from the building. So it knows where I can actually walk, that I have to take a stairway. All this, again, was automatically generated. I will skip the trajectory and just right away uh, move to that location and just go to the back um, so that you have a nice view of this, um, of this facility here. And let's say, oh, that's, that's a nice place. Um, so why don't we just go and meet there? You would just go ahead and copy this address here um, of your browser and put it, let's say, into uh, any other um, browser or whatever using, you could send it via SMS or WhatsApp or email, and then you will right away be forwarded to that location and you can really share your current location or whatever you see with anyone. And this re really enables now to have this context, this 3D context being linked into any other software. Anything that you do, all the processes that exist today, you just have to have a link and now you can actually get a 3D location for that in a context, um, how these things work together in 3D. So with this, I would like to go back to the uh, presentation. And um, what you have seen now are the technologies to, um, to map a building and to visualize a building. And now the third part that I would like to show you is actually how to determine your own position indoors. We've already seen that this is a very important topic for the future um, of positioning. And so this is, by the way, also like the first time that we uh, present this in such, uh, to such an audience. And um, on the left side, you actually see the virtual reality view on how navigation looks like to the user. On the right side, it's a 2D navigation view. But before we go right into how the application actually looks like, I would like to show you how it actually works. So obviously, we'll start with uh, very detailed maps that come from the trolley. And to rephrase, what we have is a geometry, so like a 2D or a 3D map. We have the texture, like the imagery. We have um, Wi-Fi fingerprints, Bluetooth fingerprints, we have also magnetic field disturbances. And um, with two-day smartphones, all of these um, information can be also sensed. And now it can be used as a location cue to determine where, I'm actually, where I actually am. Um, while all of them, like individually, might fail altogether, they are very robust. And to do that, we need, first of all, to have a very efficient and scalable um, sensor fusion approach, approach. In our case, it's actually a graph-based sensor fusion in a way that the graph is actually an abstraction of the, um, of the building geometry. Kind of it, it simplifies that to the point that a corridor is uh, just modeled by an edge on a graph. So that actually simplifies the geometry of a building and allows us to perform the sensor fusion in a quiet and efficient way. So with this in our back, we can, for instance, start with a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth-based localization. If Wi-Fi or Bluetooth is available, if not, we won't. But if it's available, then we will get that at least into a range of like 100 meters um, of positioning uh, accuracy um, and to get some idea of where we approximately are. Let's say at least in what building we are. The next thing is that the camera of the smartphone will actually capture the visual appearance of its environment uh, by taking images. And then we use computer vision and deep learning based algorithms to match this single image to our uh, 3D model recorded by the trolley and thereby derive our location. And you can imagine that this is a quite challenging task. There is like low lighting conditions, there is uh, people running around, dynamic objects, changes over time. And it of course has to be very scalable so that we localize in a uh, university context of more than 200,000 square meters. And in the end, however, um, I, would, I would love to tell, tell you a little bit more about this, uh, maybe in the question and answer sections. But um, just to summarize that, um, it's very much similar to the human orientation that it tries to identify the visual appearance of the visually most similar looking location. So it really identifies there by your position. So once this is done, we basically got an absolute or global position with an accuracy of one or two meters. That's what we get from our vision-based localization. And this is actually the toughest part. The initial position is really the most challenging thing. Once we have done this and the user moves on, we basically just have to track him to know where he has continued, where he has moved on. And we can actually do that by using step detection. So the acceleration sensors in our I, two days IMUs can help us doing that. And also the direction we can estimate from the magnetic field sensors. 
And so with this uh, estimated walking pattern, we can match that to the geometry, to the 2D or 3D map of our environment. And altogether, we then be able to track the user for several hundred meters. So now I would like to show you how that actually looks um, in, in the application itself. So what I brought here is a video of um, the debug version of the, of the app. So that shows you how the sensor fusion and all this is actually done. So as I said, um, if the user wants to have an accurate position of, its, uh, yeah, of himself, then we'll just briefly hold up um, the smartphone and um, actually the ca then this, this current image will be matched to the 3D model um, of the trolley. And you can see here now um, in this map, there's these uh, small green dots. They actually indicate the positions of the visually most similar um, scenes. And they, as you can see, are very clustered very, at a very small peak inside this campus of more than 200,000 square meters. And what is now visible is also the probability distribution that we model based on the graph. And if we um, now move on and uh, basically uh, go into this open area, you see basically how the probability distribution spreads out into the open space. Uh, so this is basically just um, tracking. And now if we, however, move back into the corridor or even um, then take a left turn, you will see how the whole probability distribution consolidates again back to that peak uh, that very much um, correctly models where we actually are. So this is what we mean by map matching. So overall, you can say that a single image is good enough to position ourselves in very extensive environments. And from there on, you just get tracked um, with mostly pedometer and map matching. So now let's have a look on how this would actually look like um, to the actual user of such a, um, such a mobile app, um, positioning app. So very much like an interviewer, you can search for any kind of facility, like a library here, for instance, and he would find the library, obviously, and get some additional information, like on the opening hours. And um, now, obviously, that we already determined our own position, he can just click on Route 2, and he would directly find um, the instructions to get there. And this will be provided either in 2D here or also thanks to our mapping uh, in a virtual reality view um, that allows you to, for an even, even better orientation inside complex building scenarios and to find your way to the library. All right, so now we have mostly talked about campus navigation and orientation, but very much like with um, GPS, maps, and availability of this, this is actually the fundament of a huge variety of applications that go far beyond um, campus orientation or navigation. So you, you can imagine that a lot of processes today's indoors are actually lacking these technologies. And they could be certainly much improved if they had position and maps, and also up-to-date maps. So this could be ranging from retail applications where a consumer would just try to find uh, a certain brand or a product uh, and get guided there to construction monitor management where um, yeah, basically you could monitor and manage the progress of a, of a building construction um, on a 3D model of that um, from, any, from any location. So it would really um, speed up on, and, and improve the efficiency of today's construction processes. Parking deck, uh, we have talked about autonomous uh, driving. The first thing that you need for that is actually a map of these parking decks. And finally, also, of course, logistics, um, where the parcel is not just delivered to the entrance of a building, but actually to the place where the parcel or the, the product is actually needed, and that might be at a, a production line, for instance. So finally, I would like to show you one more example uh, where this technology is already used. And as a German, obviously, I selected the automotive industry. And uh, as you can see here, we have mapped um, the uh, full production line is more than 100,000 uh, square meters that we have been um, mapping there uh, in just a single weekend. And this is used in that case for factory planning and also logistics here. All right, so with this, I would like to uh, conclude my presentation. And uh, I would like to invite you to have a look at navis.com slash ivy.slack. We have uh, mapped this auditorium here as well a couple days ago. So you can just add your browser right now, go onto this address and have a look at virtually explore this auditorium. And also some of you have seen already the trolley outside. We're happy to demonstrate the trolley and also the navigation app. We brought some devices. So um, thanks again for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Other than that, I'm probably also out there uh, for your questions. Yeah? So, um, are you selling this? 
is that uh, <laughs> what's the business plan here? Yeah. Um, so. Um, so we actually are founded in 2013 after working uh, quite hardly on this, uh, quite a lot on this uh, during my PhD. And uh, so now we are actually uh, a company, almost 90 people by now, um, and uh, are actually provided these trolleys already now to pa um, partners in 19 countries. So we are selling this technology. We rather consider us as a technology provider than a service provider. And so we have a lot of cu uh, customers already that use this technology to provide maps and GPS indoors. So, so you mentioned service. What comes to mind immediately is this could be either a sell that device business or a service business yes. in which you go in, you know, the average company, yeah. I don't know, Slack might, but a <coughs> smaller institution might not want one of those permanently. Absolutely. And that's why most of our customers are actually right now in the, um, let's say, construction uh, business, in the architecture surveying business. So they already used um, technologies to map buildings, right? While they built this uh, auditorium, obviously they needed measurement devices anyways. And so those people actually already created these data, like point clouds at least, and 3D measurements and even models, CAD models. And with the trolley, they can do that just cheaper and faster. So these are the first um, people to adapt this technology. And they provide the services to automotive companies. They provide it also uh, to airports. We have mapped airports as well. And so of course an airport, would, uh, maybe not of course, but like an airport would typically not buy a trolley, but they would get the service from our partners. And so the first actual application that we have that is like, um, yeah, being uh, rolled out is really like the scan for CD, we call it. So it's really about surveying. And the second will be um, navigation orientation then there will be um, construction monitoring and management and parking slots. I have another question. Yeah. Hi, um, it was a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed Thanks. it. Congratulations uh, to your uh, really nice company. So my question is, um, given that you mentioned uh, a lot of your major customers currently, uh, they are construction sites, uh, construction companies, uh, how do you deal with stairs? And yeah. then uh, have you thought about maybe uh, using a different platform such as a UAV to carry mm -hmm. all the sensors? Yeah, thanks. So um, first of all, the, the trolley um, cannot map on stairs. Um, it, scan, it can scan uh, stairs by just uh, basically scanning from the top and from the bottom so that you actually have scanned them while not being on them. So the laser scanners have actually a range of 30 meters. And um, so, however, ramps and stuff like that, that's something that we can do. Um, but the, um, the reason why we didn't put all this on a UV is simply because most of the environment is actually made for humans, so we can actually walk on that. So it's, it's typically flat, except for the stairs, of course. And so um, is it um, basically made for 80% of the environment and not for 100%, we basically decided to come up with a platform that can run very, very efficiently over large-scale environments. And if you think about drones, you need to open the doors as well. You have uh, like typically like a lower time um, that you can operate them due to battery constraints, so they have to lift themselves. And um, we, we need, um, basically we want to have a panoramic camera with a very high resolution. We need that for our applications. And so um, carrying all that on a drone right now at least would be, um, in our view, a little bit over sophisticated at that point in time. But um, the future might definitely get us in this direction. Thank you. More questions back, Yeah. Um, so, how do you uh, take into account dynamic um, milestones, dyn 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 dynamic landmarks? For example, a Wi-Fi may be a mobile Wi-Fi, and it might be yes. present and be absent, or yeah. furniture might be moved. How do you handle that in your mapping algorithm? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a very good point. So dynamics um, are not just in Wi-Fi, also in vision. Things change over time. There's no way of, do, of avoiding that. And so the first thing that you need to do is to make it really robust. In the end, we look for a consensus. So we basically take as many cues, location cues in there as possible. Luckily, vision typically leaves you a lot, actually. And uh, you basically can just rule out all those that are just new because they're just noise. They don't distract you to a different location. They just don't tell you where you are. It just doesn't add anything to your positioning. Um, yeah, accuracy. And um, so it has to be robust. And the second thing is that you continuously learn. So whenever there is something new or has changed or something like that, and you still have a good location queue, uh, you can actually learn that. And so it, as long as the changes are gradual, you can remove them over time. Okay, thank you.
Thank you very much. Thanks again.